42, I will bring our reading to an end at verse 50, the end of the chapter. These are the words of Christ. So verse 42, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, now he's not speaking about young children here, physical children, he's speaking about his people, young believers for example. It is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. And if thy right hand, or sorry, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into the life maim than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm doth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life and having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their warm doth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye, than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their warm doth not, and the fire is not quenched. For every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. <laughs> salt is good, but if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith will you season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. Lord of last this very solemn portion of scripture to us tonight. These are the words, folks, of the most compassionate person that ever walked on earth. The words of the blessed Saviour, Lord Jesus Christ. We'll just have a wee short prayer and ask the Lord's help now as we turn to his word tonight. Father, we thank thee and we praise thee for the precious word of God. The conscious man shall not live by bread alone. We thank you, O God, your word is a lamp under our feet and a light under our path. We thank you it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and for instruction for righteousness sake. We pray tonight, Lord God, and thank thee the psalmist reminds us the entrance of thy word giveth light. We pray, Lord God, the glorious light of the gospel will break in and break through into some darkened part tonight who is not saved by the grace of God. And O oh God, you'll transform lives. Lives will be converted. Lives will be regenerated and brought into the family of God. Help me, O oh God, to preach this word with boldness, but yet in love, for thy glory. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. In these number of verses, as we conclude chapter 9 of Mark's Gospel, the most loving, compassionate person who ever walked this earth, the blessed, glorious, wonderful Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, reveals the radical nature of true discipleship. He reveals in these number of verses the radical nature of true discipleship, which included graphic terminology, dramatic acts, Severe warnings and shocking threats. The Lord here in these verses certainly is exposing the false profession to the true profession of Jesus Christ. From these number of verses alone certainly exposes the false liberal preachers who are really Satan's agents. False teachers who have hijacked, misrepresented, mishandled abuse the word of God under the so-called banner of love. The Lord Jesus, who was full of grace and love and truth, 
was radical in his convictions and never compromised or soft handled or played down the word of God to please man or others. The Lord did not hoodwink, the Lord did not deceive, the Lord did not manipulate anyone. The Lord did not wrap up the gospel in cotton wool to accommodate for man to feel comfortable. And sadly, folks, that is prominent in our land today. And is it any wonder it's only perfections in many cases and not possessions? The Lord did not proclaim a half so called gospel to fear a man in their terms to make them comfortable. You see, about today, folks, sad to say there's a deceptive, man centered, so called gospel. The gospel is, is all about Christ from the beginning. He's the author and finisher of faith. Salvation is of the Lord. No, the Lord was radical regarding salvation and discipleship. There's a cost, there's a cross of following Him and being truly saved by His wonderful grace. The Lord was transparent. There was no hidden agenda with him. It was transparent and never made it easy. An easy believism to be saved and follow him. Dear friends, the Lord in his mercy and grace, he was always transparent and he never made it easy for anyone regarding salvation. I've preached on maybe a month ago regarding take up your cross and follow me. The Lord was radical in this most important issue regarding salvation, discipleship, following him. The Lord's language here from this passage is severe, serious, forceful, an extreme radical with sure conviction regarding the proper call the true discipleship. Someone said the Lord's message here is essential for the time in which we live, when much of so-called Christianity, even evangelical Christianity, is marked by shallow superficiality. Some have turned evangelism into religious salesmanship and converted the Bible into a self-help manual to make you successful. What a quote. So this man quoted, some have turned evangelism into religious salesmanship and converted the Bible into a self-help manual to make you successful. Such deception. The requirements which is a very high cost to follow and be a true disciple of Jesus Christ even though it's the greatest honour and privilege to be saved by the grace of God. But the true discipleship it is a high cost, it is a high standard. And to follow the Lord of course is His grace that gives us the power and ability to do that, to be a true disciple. A disciple means a follower of a person on their teachings. And to be a follower and true disciple of Jesus Christ requires repentance. Matthew chapter 4. It requires denying ourselves. Matthew 16. It requires to take up your cross, which could mean suffering or even death for Christ's sake. Luke 9, becoming a martyr if needs be. It requires willing to forsake all if required. Matthew 19. And it requires an unconditionally to follow him, whatever the cost, John 12. It is not just take him or leave him. Be casual with Jesus Christ. In your own selfish terms, which suits your agenda when you feel like it. Such a deception. Such selfish pride. Dear friends, this is the God of glory we're dealing with. The one who loveth righteousness and hateth iniquity. No, the reality and condition is the Lord has to have preeminence in a true believer's life. You cannot divide Lord and Saviour, it is a complete union. 
Is it any wonder the Lord Jesus stated in the Sermon on the Mount, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth from the life, and few there be that find it. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, this is the very end of this tremendous Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. We've been looking at this in our studies over the last number of weeks from the book of James about the true believer is a doer. He applies or she applies God's word in their lives. What a shock that will be in the day of judgment. What a shock that this has been. Lloyd Jones says this has to be one of the most horrific, terrifying verses in Scripture. I never knew to depart from me. People dying and thinking they're okay with the Lord and they end up perishing. Folks, I really do fear. For so many who profess, and I say that in love, but there does not seem to be much reality or evidence. No commitment, half heartedness, lukewarmness. This passage reveals three aspects in relation to true radical discipleship to follow Jesus Christ. First of all, we have radical love. Secondly, we have radical purity. And thirdly, we have radical sacrifice and obedience. So first of all, what we can get from this passage tonight is radical love. Verse 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. Radical love. The Lord Jesus is radical and zealous for unity amongst his true church, now the true church. As the scriptures command us many times to love one another, love the brethren. The Lord despises prejudice and disunity. God has always been protective in relation to his people. Even regarding Israel in the Old Testament, never mind the church today, the bride of Christ, God likened assaulting his people to poking him in the eye. Zechariah tells us, He who touches you touches the apple, the pupil of his eye. In the context, the Lord was rebuking his disciples here as they were arguing, having a heated debate. Who shall be the greatest, which could cause division and disunity, as well as rebuking John regarding the danger of causing others to stumble while serving the Lord? Verse 38, we looked at this the last time. Verse 38 of chapter 9 it says, And John answered him, as the Lord say, Master, we saw one casting out devils in our name or demons, and he followed us, not us, and we hindered him or forbid him. Because he follows not us, but Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. The Lord had a rebuke John. God expects and desires his true church to treat each other with respect and love. Not to be a hindrance or a stumbling block to one another, but to have peace with one another. To be unity in the Spirit. Of course we need wisdom and discernment, what is true of the Spirit. We don't be gullible either. And what is false in the flesh. It seems the disciples in their pride were not getting along with each other. They were arguing to see who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Nor did they get along with other believers. This is why the Lord rebuked John here, because John was speaking against this other believer who was casting out demons. And these disciples of the Lord, when they were full of pride, they weren't getting along with each other, and they weren't getting along with other believers at that present time. They were divisive and contentious. They were full of prejudice. The Lord had rebuked them and gave the disciples a lesson by teaching them 
on how one treats a true believer is the way they treat Christ as Christ lives within every single true believer who are saved by the grace of God. There's no distinctions, there's no superiority, there's no inferiority, there's no favoritism in the body of Christ. Everyone is equal. The truth on how one treats a true believer is how one treats Christ prompted the Lord's warning against causing one of his children to stumble in verse 42 it says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones of believe in me. Of course the Lord is not speaking about physical children here, but is referring to his children, the bride of Christ, who are saved in the body of Christ in which someone tries to influence, convince, pressurize them into temptation and lead them into sin by being a stumbling block, especially a young believer in Christ who is vulnerable to more deception. The serious repercussions for that person is in verse 42. It tells us, It is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. In other words, it would be better to die a horrible death by drowning than to cause or be a bad influence, a stumbling block to a young believer, a young Christian, to entice him into sin. The person whose desire to be a stumbling block of a believer can use different means, of course, to entice and get the weak young believer to fall, trip them up. First of all, they can try to captivate the immature young believer by direct temptation. Direct temptation. Think of Potiphar's wife. As she measured, she cornered Joseph, a young man who's 17 years old, and looked with lustful desire, burning lustful desire, and said to Joseph, lie with me. You see, it was direct temptation. Solomon said, if sinners entice you, do not consent. The Apostle Paul reminds us, neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Direct temptation may involve specific sins, such as gospel. Folks, beware of someone who tries to throw a wee bit of bait at you to get you to try and gossip about someone else. Beware of that. Direct temptation can also be stealing, lying, cheating, covetousness. Think of the internet as a great tool that was used right. But folks, how easy it is to covet when we go onto the internet and go, I want that, I want that, and do we really need it half the time? Direct temptation can come through immorality, sexual sins. It's a serious thing for a person to become a stumbling block to a young believer in Jesus Christ and trip them up. The Lord says it's better for them to have a horrible death by drowning, a millstone around their neck. Secondly, what about indirect temptation, which can be a stumbling block to a young believer? Parents, for example, can be so overprotective for their children. Now, of course, when you if two believers and they dedicate their child to the Lord, one of the prospects is to protect them the best they can. And out of love, no matter what believers in it, and love parents will do their utmost to protect their children. But at times they can be too overprotective, overbearing to the extreme, but also the opposite. They can show favoritism to one child over another, lack of kindness, lack of attention, lack of forgiveness, which can provoke their children or child to anger who profess salvation. The parents can actually become a stumbling block to a young believer. This is why parents in some cases need wisdom and discernment from the Lord to strike the right balance or else they can become a stumbling block. Thirdly, what about setting an example that will cause others to sin? God's people are supposed to, we are saved 
to glorify the Lord in our body and our spirit. This is why we're here, folks. We're here to glorify God. That's the ultimate principle why we're saved. To glorify the Lord and serve Him. And the Lord has called us unto holiness to glorify Him. Someone could be professing salvation for years, but has never grown up in their faith, their walk. They're still immature in their walk instead of being mature. Why are they saved or not? Only the Lord knows that. But is participating in something in which a new convert sees and is grieved by this. But then the new convert, the young believer, then realizes, sure, if, if he or she can do that, who has professed for years, surely it's okay for me to do that, which can entice, become a snare and a stumbling block to that young believer. There's many examples out there. Example, prime one, drinking alcohol. I have a preaching on that subject again at the, at the end of this incoming month. I preached on it last year and I believe the Lord has pressed in the Spirit to, to preach on it again, the important subject, especially when that wicked evil festival of Halloween is at the end of the month. So I'll be preaching again regarding should a Christian drink alcohol. You see, folks, we're supposed to glorify the Lord. Um, drinking alcohol certainly does not glorify the Lord. But I'll touch on that and I'll preach on it in the next number of weeks by God's grace. So, first of all, we've looked at radical love regarding true dis discipleship. Don't be a stumbling block to a young believer. But secondly, here we have radical purity. Verse 43, as we go on in the passage. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life name than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their warm death not, and the fire is not quenched. Of course the Lord is not commanding literal physical surgery here, but is teaching that sin in the inner person is like a cancerous tumour to the body and must be dealt with immediately before it ultimately destroys. Whatever in our lives which causes us to sin, stumble, must be mortified, must be cut off, must be removed immediately. Don't play the fool with sin, because sin will make a fool out of you. Sin is dangerous, folks. John Owen, the 17th century English Puritan, stated this, where sin, through the neglect of mortification, gets a considerable victory. It breaks the bones of the soul and makes a man weak, sick and let him die. Referring to David, when he, when he held on to sin regarding Bathsheba, and Uriah until Nathan came and rebuked him. The Bible reminds us to put off to abstain, to mortify. Paul says, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But God's people are in the spirit. But if you through the spirit, you mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. In these verses of this passage, the Lord mentions the hand in verse 43. He mentions the foot in verse 45. He mentions the eye in verse 47. Why did he do that? The Lord mentions these body parts which emphasizes the aspect of a person's life. What they do, the hand, where they go, the foot, and what they see or watch, the eye. The high calling from the Lord is radical. It is severe action against anything that hinders the pursuit of holiness, righteousness, and purity throughout the Christian life. True Christianity, folks, is a very high calling. True Christianity is a very high standard. Some are, some are being deceived, thinking they have made this profession of faith, but yet their lives have not truly really been transformed by God's grace as they continue on their general pattern of their lives, their consistent pattern of their lives, is that they're still in their sin. There's no fruit 
thinking that grace covers it all. I have made this profession that grace covers it all. I'm all right. I have a ticket for heaven. I have eternal life. And you know, folks, they are being completely hoodwinked, deluded. It is a fraud. It is antinomianism. Yet the scriptures make it abundantly clear. Whosoever committeth practices sin, continues on in sin, is the servant of sin. Whosoever committeth practices sin is of the devil. Let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Shall we continue in sin and grace may abound? God forbid. You see, folks, when God, God's people who are truly saved by the grace of God, God's people will hate sin. There's times they kill him, not dispute that, but sin doesn't have dominion over us. The power has been broken, that we can live a godly life. But God's people will hate sin, and they will desire righteousness. They will desire to please the Lord. The drastic, radical action Jesus had in mind here regarding the hand, the foot, and the eye was, of course, not physical mutilation. Sadly, down through the centuries, misguided ascetics have foolishly assumed that the way to defeat sin was by mutilating themselves, by being severely self disciplined, being a hermit, a recluse, etc., etc. But the real problem is the heart, which needs to be regenerated. God's life entering into the soul, born again in the Spirit of God, made pure because man's heart in the natural, sinful state is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, Jeremiah tells us, which in return expresses itself through the avenue of the hand, the foot, and the eye. Of course, as well as the mouth, we looked at this morning. The Lord Jesus Himself, in Mark chapter seven, we discovered this maybe two or three months ago, gave a list of thirteen different sins which proceed from the heart. I wonder tonight, has your heart, your soul, been touched? Is it regenerated by God's grace? Are you truly born again? Are you truly saved? Does the Holy Spirit dwell within? Has there been a time that you've truly humbled yourself before God, come God's way, and repented, finished with your sin, confessed your sin to God, and received God's glorious salvation in Jesus Christ? You see, folks, if Christ isn't in you, if you're not born again, if God's Spirit does not dwell within you, Paul reminds us, if you have the Spirit of Christ, you're none of his. And that case said, if you have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within you, you're not in the bride of Christ, you're still in your sin. You're still practicing your sin. And sin is still your master. And you have no power to overcome it within yourself. Which will lead you to that horrendous, awful place which we have already read about at least four times in this passage. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Hell. Hell fire. This solemn message from the Saviour regarding hell carries a grave warning that sin has to be dealt with drastically. Kill sin before it kills you. How can I have my sins dealt with? It's only being in Jesus Christ. Are you holding on to your sin? Are you saved? Is your sins gone? The word hell here, folks, translated is Gehenna, which comes from a Hebrew phrase, the Valley of Hinnom which refers to an actual valley outside Jerusalem where wicked King Ahaz worshipped Moloch, the false god of the Ammonites, a fire god, and even sacrificed his children in the fire. The valley of Hinnom was eventually converted into a rubber stone. 
outside Jerusalem, in which a fire burned continually in the midst of the rubbish. The Lord Jesus' words are not to be taken lightly at any time. As they composed the strongest call to discipleship, as he challenges everyone, no matter what they profess, to either deal radically with sin or be cast into the never ending furnace of fire, the eternal garbage pit of hell. Dear friends, tonight hell is a real place. Yes. Just like heaven. As it is not temporary, but it is forever. In verse 43, verse 44, 45, 46, 48, the Lord says about being cast in the hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Do you see your need tonight? What the Lord is saying here, a life without Christ is a complete waste of life. It is futile. It is in vain. And folks, I say this in the authority of Christ's words, and I say this in love. But don't make any apologies for it either. It's a life of waste if you're not in Christ, and it's only fit for the eternal garbage fiery pit of hell, Gehenna. According from Christ's perspective, we cannot lie. Oh, how essential it is for sinners to be saved. Are you saved tonight? That's what it means, saved, folks. Saved from our sin and saved from God's wrath, which He's going to punish sinners and the devil and the demons, a place prepared in hell forever and ever, where the fire shall never be quenched. Horrendous, but yet, folks, God's justice is perfect. This takes me to my final point as a conclude. We've looked here at radical purity. We've looked at radical love. But finally here we have radical sacrifice and obedience. Verse 49 and 50. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith will you season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. Salt speaks of purity and preservation. In the Old Testament, the Jews were not allowed to put leaven or honey on their sacrifices, but were required to use salt. There was five different sacrifices Burnt offerings. There was the the burnt offering. Sorry, there was the meaty grain offering. Five different sacrifices unto the Lord. There was the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the transgression guilt offering. But it seems the Lord was mainly indicating in this passage to the grain offering, as Moses states. Every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from the grain offering. The grain offering was one of the five Old Testament offerings which symbolized total consecration, devotion to the Lord. So as salt speaks of purity and preservation, God expects his people to be pure and committed, welded, yielded fully to Him. That's why Paul tells us to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 49 For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Is your life a sacrifice every day, consecration unto the Lord? The disciples were God's salt. And instead of rebuking others, 
They should have been examining their own hearts. They were in danger of losing their flavour and becoming less effective, dry, boring in that sense. You see, it is easy to settle down. It is easy to play routine church. It's great to say as tonight, it's great that folk come to church as commendable. But folks, Christianity is just not about going to church. It is easy to settle down. It is easy to lose our saltiness, our zeal, our vitality, our drive, our hunger, our thirst to go through the motions and become ineffective, useless to some degree to God if we lose our saltiness. Commitment, obedience, and godly character are the essentials if we are to glorify God and to have peace one with another as the Lord instructed his disciples in verse 50 salt is good you see salt was for purely and preservation but if the salt have lost the saltness wherewith will you season it have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another the Lord's rebuke to his disciples as they were arguing of who was to be the greatest. When believers engage in radical, loving, pure, sacrificial, obedient discipleship, they will be radical witnesses as there is no other spiritual influences for modeling the truth, only the true disciples of Jesus who are the salt of the earth. I trust tonight as believers that we are committed. We have not lost that saltness. We have still that zeal. We are maturing more and more, being conformed in the image of Christ's likeness. We have that drive, we have that hunger, we have that thirst that we're challenged of blessing for His glory. That we're committed that we're excited about the things of God. But folks, the contrast is, we've looked here at the danger, the great danger of professions. You see, true Christianity is radical. Jesus Christ is radical. And he expects his people to be radical. Totally and utterly committed, hunger, thirsting, hate and sin, and following after godliness, purity, righteousness to glorify His wonderful name. The Lord has said, No matter what you profess, if you continue on in them sins, practicing those sins, which is a sign of not a true believer anyway, because a true believer does not continue on in sin. A true believer walks in the light. The Lord says it doesn't matter what you profess, you'll perish. I wonder tonight, have you truly repented? Have you received Christ? Or is it just a profession of faith? And the Lord bless these few words to us this evening. Thank you for your patience, for love and for O oh, Father, we thank thee for thy word. We thank thee for your truth. We thank thee for the divine revelation of thy word through Jesus Christ. We thank thee, Lord Jesus, you were not in the business of deceiving anyone or manipulation. You were not a gospel salesman. But Lord Jesus, we thank thee, we praise thee, you were the one who preached the full counsel and the truth of the gospel. And Lord God, in these days, help us always to preach the full counsel and the truth of Jesus Christ. Lord God, we pray, Father, in these days, Lord Father, that thou will help us by thy grace to glorify thee. O God, as Paul reminds us, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, 
perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We pray, Father, instill our fear even more in us. Help us to revere thee even more. But yet, Lord God, Father, because we respect thee, not out of duty, but Lord God, out of love, we thank thee, O God, for thy goodness to us. We pray in these days for the people of God. Help us, Father, to hate sin. And help us to love holiness and righteousness for thy glory. And Father, we pray, O God, that any not saved. O God, I pray that thou wilt speak to them. And thou wilt convict them. And Father, help them to count the cross. Be willing to take up their cross. And Lord God, follow thee. We thank thee and we praise thee for thy great salvation. We thank thee it is the best way, because it's God's way. As for God, his way is perfect. And Father, thank you for delivering so many in this gathering this evening. That, O oh God, you're bringing us to glory, and you're changing us from glory to glory. Help us, O oh God, to bring glory to thy name and to mature more and more in these days, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. 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 Thank you for coming. The Lord bless you.